This is Ken Forrester, Executive Director at Momenta. Welcome to our Digital Thread Podcast, produced by, for, and about digital industry leaders. In this series of conversations, we capture insights from the best and brightest minds in digital industry. Their executives, entrepreneurs, advisors, and other thought leaders. What they have in common is like our team at Momenta, they are deep industry operators. We hope you find these podcasts informative, and as always, we welcome your comments and suggestions. Good day and welcome to episode 153 of our Momenta Digital Thread podcast series. Today, it's my great pleasure to welcome Jay Onda, Corporate Venture Capital Advisory Board member for the National Venture Capital Association. Jay has been at the forefront of innovation, technology, and design for nearly two decades. He was a founding member of the Corporate Innovation and Venture Practice at Yamaha Motor Ventures, was instrumental in evolving NTT Docomo's R&D Group to become an open innovation platform, sourced multiple unicorns for NTT Docomo Capital, and pivoted an innovation outpost to unlock strategic value creation for Orange Silicon Valley. He has worked with corporations and governments globally to inspire, teach, and coach organizations looking to embrace innovation best practices. He has a deep passion for usability and user-centric design and has used this to help scale innovation in multinational corporations and to accelerate startups. Jay, welcome to our Digital Thread podcast. Hello. Thank you for having me. Ah, So good to, uh, to have you. I know you and I had a chance to interact years ago, and I don't remember what, maybe it was an event or maybe a, a co-shared deal, but um, I um, am so pleased to finally be able to have you on uh, on this podcast because, you know, we love this intersection of corporate uh, and, and, and innovation, corporate venturing, if you will, and you've clearly been, uh, been a leader in that. I always like to start these, though, to kind of talk about one's own journey and, you know, what we like to call the digital thread. So, what would you consider to be your digital thread? In other words, the you know one or more thematic threads that define your digital industry journey. Mm-hmm. Um, the the common thread throughout my career has been focusing on the experience. So whether that's user experience and product design or customer experience, really taking this human centric approach to solving a problem, and that's been this common thread for every role that I've taken, uh, both on the startup side and on the corporate innovation and venture side. Um, In my younger days, I saw this ABC Nightline segment about IDEO's shopping cart design process. Uh, And they documented how IDEO does product design and they look at problems from various perspectives while iterating on their approach. Uh, And that was this aha moment, uh, unbeknownst to me at that time, Um, but it became this inspiration to my approach today. And so through the phases of the startup life cycle, I've been on you know, early stage ventures um, and really trying to understand how we pitch our vision to the investors, how we sell this to our enterprise customers, and then also how to uh, work with the engineering team to break down these visions into manageable uh, milestones, right? And so all of this centers around the experience, right? And creating this right experience so that we could create that excitement uh, and buy-in and, and trust. And so, um, and so I, I, I appreciate this user-centric or human-centric design element because I think that centers around everything that I've done thus far. I like that as as well. Uh, call it a general aesthetic, if you will, for you know innovation for for business for startups. And uh, and I've you know dealt with uh, a number of very sharp people who have come from that kind of design aesthetic background, and and the ability to see the patterns you know broader is is pretty cool. So. Your profile, what I found very interesting, really kind of seems to be you're operating at the vent of, you know, what I'll say, corporate venturing, innovation, and and startups. What uh, what does corporate venturing mean to you, and and how do you see it interacting or intersecting with innovation and and startups? And so, how you leverage venture depends on your strategy and what you're set to accomplish. Um, there's this interesting data from the Global Corporate Venturing Group, uh, and the report reports show that you know the The capital deployed and the new corporate venture entities created have been growing year over year, almost 5x over the last decade. So when we look at why, the majority of them are looking to find strategic opportunities for their parent company as well as financial returns. 
And so, um, you know, there's there's really fun data. There's a really fun data point uh, in a book called "The Corporate Innovation in the Fifth Era" by the authors Matthew Lemaire and Allison David, and they survey C-level executives on where the next important innovation from your industry will come. So, is it A, your company? B, your industry, or C, outside your industry. Um, Ken, do you care to take a guess? Um, I would have to expect that it's going to come from outside in, as uh, P and G used to like to say. Yeah, absolutely. So consistently throughout, but less than 1% says that it comes from your company. And there's roughly a 50-50 split between your industry and outside your industry, right? And so this just indicates that the corporates are sourcing innovation from the outside, you know, whether it's new technologies or new businesses or building relationships with startups. Um, in, you know, in other corporates and tangential industries, they're they're externalizing their innovation efforts right, or their R&D efforts. And so corporate venture acts as a bridge. Um, on the business side, corporates invest to gain access uh, to uh, tapping into talent, access and gaining insights on how new markets are evolving or new customer segments. Um, and on the other side, you know, startups also gain access right to the corporate strengths, whether it's in new markets or to their existing customer base, uh, other types of relationships, techno expert, technical expertise, et cetera. So when the corporate innovation strategy alignment is designed and executed correctly, this partnership becomes a two-way bridge. Um, each has something unique to offer. Both have huge potential gains. And this is where I think is really interesting how corporate innovation has evolved over time, leveraging venture to work with startups. We'll, uh, we'll talk in a moment. I've got, uh, certainly, I'd like to go down this when it's done right, right? As you mentioned, when it's done correctly. Mm -hmm. um, what I also like about your background, though, is that you also uh, have operated at the intersection of, uh, of U.S. And, and, and Japanese business culture, you know, given your background with uh, NTD Docomo, uh, Yamaha as an example. Uh, and, and so I'm kind of curious, how would you characterize the difference in the approach to corporate venturing and perhaps innovation between, you know, generally I'll say East and West? Um, sure. So, uh, as you can imagine, the business culture between Japan and U.S. are quite different. And so, stereotypically speaking, the Japanese corporations are, are more risk-averse, requires consensus for decisions. They delay that decision-making speed, right? But that doesn't change the speed of how Silicon Valley uh, Silicon Valley's venture ecosystem works. And so, there's a mismatch in personalities, but, and, and there's also a mismatch in um, how to work together. And so, over time, the Japanese CVCs, you know, if they want to get in the, the round, they have to evolve from their existing mindset. So, as we know, venture capital is a, is a business of relationships, uh, especially in Silicon Valley, your, your reputation matters. And so we've seen these innovation outposts and, and CVC groups being formed in the U.S., right, Out, a little bit outside of their, their corporate walls so that they could react and and build that right relationships within the ecosystem correctly right it's i i often have a conversation with first time multinational corporations coming into silicon valley saying well this is our brand this is who we are like people should come to us and i said no 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 that doesn't work in silicon valley right when we sit down at the table with a founder early stage or not we have you know even power right we're we're here we're talking you know face to face eye to eye and, and really trying to figure out how we work together to create that win-win. Um, and so, you know, that's that's the behavior that has to change. That's the mindset that has to change. And it's really hard to execute overseas. And so you need a team here locally uh, to kind of conform to the Silicon Valley norms. And then, of course, you know, do a lot of the heavy lift internally to make sure that they could execute correctly. So trend-wise, what's interesting is that about half of the U.S.-based deals with CVC participation has Japanese corporates on their cap table, either directly or indirectly. And so what this means is that the groups, these types of groups, as mentioned, they're gaining autonomy in their decision-making criteria. And maybe this is becoming less strategic. But again, they've done this heavy lifting early on to create that strategic alignment before that transaction was made. Um, what was different was Docomo was a single, it was a sing, it structured as a single LP fund. And so the way we sourced and evaluated deals was different than Yamaha, which was off balance sheet in the beginning. Um, but whichever way, in both situations, you know, I personally had to arm myself 
with the value proposition that our corporate parent can bring to the table, right? Because we are looking to create that strategic relationship. We want to be a value added partner. Um, and this is this was one of the ways that we've gained that trust uh, with the startup companies, with their investors as well, so that we could participate in their round. This is a, such a fascinating space because um, um, Japan in particular and Asia in general has a I'll call it a um, an evolutionary partnership approach. And what I've seen is, you know, you start with commercial partnerships and you move to investment, then maybe you move to a joint venture and ultimately maybe an acquisition where, you know, stereotypically the West can move from, hey, I like these guys to acquiring them overnight, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and But I've always seen this kind of, you slowly build up the relationship and you build up the trust, right? And uh, and so it's, it is a bit different in that regard. I love your uh, stat about uh, the number Number or the, I'll call it the, the the ownership or the investment by Japanese companies, you know, across the board because uh, uh, they're they're pretty much everywhere, right? And uh, and it's uh, very influential in that regard. So. You've uh, you've served on this uh, corporate venture capital advisory board for the National Venture Capital Association since uh, since 28 uh, 2018. Excuse me. In fact, I think I saw that you were also named among top 100 rising stars among corporate venture capitalists along the way as well. Can you uh, tell us a bit about the organization and and what some of the key topics are these days for corporate venture capital? Sure, absolutely. So. The NVCA uh, advocates for public policy that supports the American startup and venture ecosystem. They serve the, the venture community as a trade association and service the community for, for success by providing um, resources, data, education, and networking. And so I serve the CVC group and co-lead a program called the CBC Mentor Studio, which is a peer-driven program for CBC professionals. And here we have this um, closed, forum, closed forum, essentially, for CBCs uh, to share, learn, and discuss best practices, um, talk about tactical tips and tricks, and other topics to create success in corporate venture. Uh, you know, as mentioned earlier, CBCs are looking for strategic and financial returns. Now, where they sit on that spectrum varies, but uh, their mandates and efforts look different than an institutional VC. And venture capital is an apprenticeship business. So as CVCs create this new group uh, to do venture, especially in Silicon Valley, you know, there's a lot of best practices, there's a lot of mentorship that's required to be on par with what the tier one you know, VCs expect. And so I was really grateful for the CVC ecosystem when I started because they taught me so many things. You know, I looked at my peers and in, in other firms and they helped me kind of accelerate my learning to know strategically, tactically what I should do, what I could do, you know, things like that. And so, um, you know, this is my way of, of supporting the ecosystem. And as mentioned, most CVCs are less than 10 years old. So that means that they lack experience, the history of, of Silicon Valley and, and that relationship building aspect of VC funds. Um, and again, you know, what's really nice is that the CVC community is, is very collaborative, right? They're looking for strategic fit with startups um, that in different lenses. So you, you know, two corporates could be in the same industry, but what they, how they define strategic value or strategic partnerships are vary. And so we're here to support each other. And so this community is really interesting because we talk about things that are very meaningful for CVC professionals. Um, a really good example, one of my more favorite ones is board member best practices, right? As a CVC, as a corporate citizen, and as a board member, we have dual fiduciary roles. So what do we do? How do we behave? How do we excuse ourselves from certain things that may cause conflict of interest? Um, you know, those are, are, are very touchy topics that you really can't learn from a book, right? And so, you know, we, we set up this forum, we, we bring in a couple of experienced professionals to, to talk through uh, some of the challenges, how to work around things, how to, how to think about their approach on, on uh, particular issues. Other fun topics would be things like structuring commercial agreements. You know, how do we use a side letter? What's fair for the founders? You know, what what can we do so that it doesn't frustrate or upset the other investors? Um, to to more um, 
to more meaningful, you know, to to other things like uh, talent management for di diver diversity and inclusion. Uh, that was the most recent topic that we had was really to to make sure that you know DNI and proper representation exists in CBC. And so again, you know, we're, we pick and choose some of these topics and and spend some time together to talk about everything that um, may not be casually discussed in an open forum, right? And so we, we abide by the Chatham House rules uh, and, and really try to create that, that open format so that we could di discuss freely. What a great uh, opportunity, not only to participate, but in your case, to uh, to give back or you know, perhaps even pay it forward. Uh, and I, I love the topic of, uh, in terms of uh, DNI. I know in Silicon Valley, in particular, it's been a hot topic among you know cor or venture capital and corporate venture capital for some time. Uh, clearly, in Europe, where we're operating from, um, especially around board membership, you're seeing a lot of the same. And so it's uh, it's uh, it's nice to see. So very timely topic. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, let's go back to your earlier comment when done correctly, right? Given your uh, your decade of experience across corporate venture uh, venturing, what best practices have you seen in driving the most impactful innovation in uh, in those uh, you know, the limited partners or funding corporations you've dealt with? Yeah, um, you know, I've, again, I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of first-time corporates and government entities looking to foster innovation. And so, you know, we start off very at the high level, right? And first and foremost, you need C-level support, right? You need the C-level support to mandate change the company, you know, to to influence the their culture to embrace innovation. Um, it's not to say that every business unit and every person, every employee has to be the innovator, but it is required to move the company forward. And so, without proper support, you'll see a lot of pushback and inaction. And so, this is where a lot of the problems arise, right? And so, you know, I've I've been part of a team where we were trying to streamline this in from the side, um, and there's a lot of people who didn't care, right? And so trying to change that mindset to build that trust took a long time. Um, the second, it should be really clear why a company needs to embrace innovation. And so this could be a cultural thing, it could be a tactical thing, but it needs, there has to be a vision statement that can be translated into actionable tactics. So articulating the desired outcomes is always a plus. You know, so for example, a hardware company trying to become or wanting to transform into becoming a more software centric company, right? And so, um, you know, but some kind of vision so that everybody understands the new direction of where they're going and why they need to embrace innovation so that they could try. Um, and uh, to, to, just to attach to that, you know, also to um, allow failure. And, and because innovation is messy, right? It's an iterative process. And so a rigid structure, a rigid process where corporates operate versus the kind of the messy, noisy, you know, startup ecosystem, there's a huge difference in culture, right? And so for first timers, I always encourage experimentation, right? Spend time to learn. And it's at that point, it's really hard to objectively measure your outputs. But if you build your reporting capabilities to share insights, knowledge with you know key influences, influencers and decision makers within your organization, um, that's kind of the beginning step to to collaborate and build this next iteration of innovation together. And so again, you know, this becomes this relationship building exercise, but really to for for the common goal of this vision of why you need to embrace innovation. And then lastly, leverage the community. Right, the CBC community, as mentioned, is is very unique and collaborative. Uh, again, you know, we're here to support each other, share our experiences, and, and there's so many innovation frameworks and playbooks out there. So selecting one or the other is really the easy part, um, especially because there's a lot of commonalities in the approach, but there's no silver bullet. Right? There isn't this, this master guide of how you execute for, for success. Uh, and the reason why is that the corporations have a culture, right? they're supported by people. And so the hardest part is at that relationship level. Again, just gaining trust, the support, being able to work out the details and finding the right motivation to, to innovate together. 
So it has to be relevant to the uh, to the corporation, and and that that uh, that buffering, if you will, of what is relevant depends very much on corporations and and their own innovation capabilities. Uh, as uh, as I mentioned earlier in the podcast, uh, you know, P and G back in the day called it outside in, right? Mm -hmm. And and so it clearly um, you know rolls from the top down in that whole organization, and of course, you know, uh, hallmarks like GE and others have 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 also heralded you know how they go about. Doing that as well. Um, you mentioned, you know, kind of the general, if you will, um, uh, criteria for, um, you know, kind of best practice you've seen. Let's put a point on that. You know, which corporate venture capitalists would you call out as, you know, really the most successful? Those that, you know, in some sense, you know, you could benchmark yourself with. Sure. Uh, so, you know, CVC efforts ebb and flow for a variety of reasons. Right, and and it could be because of management change, management leadership change. It could be because of you know the economic downturn. There's a lot of reasons why. But I've always admired Intel, Intel Capital, for example. Um, they they were one of the pioneers in CVC, and and so they've gone through multiple iterations, um, multiple evolutions of their organization. And uh, but they've always been on this front line of of influencing the community. So, for example, uh, back in I think 2016, they announced at the company level this huge DNI effort, and they set these targets for 2020. In 2018, at the GCBI conference, you know, they gave this talk, and they actually met their 2020 goals in 2018. So two years ahead of schedule. So they said, well, we're going to continue this momentum, right? And so, you know, they, they hit their goals and said, okay, well, we, we're going to continue to become more ambitious. And so, you know, they, they've always provided that thought leadership in what CVCs do and, and have done right. So I've always respected them. Um, they're, they're, you know, they're actually in the middle of another iteration as we speak. So we'll see how this evolves, but, um, you know, always, always, always a great case study. Um, other groups like Microsoft and M12 have done really in interesting investments, making great bets. Um, groups like M12 and GV are less strategic, and that's why they kind of branded away from their core parent company, although the M and M12 is, is alluding to Microsoft and GV, the G and GV is for Google. But, you know, it, it really points to making investments in relevant companies for the parent company, but not necessarily a strategic fund, right? And so um, they've kind of evolved their CVC efforts so that they could, again, operate more freely. And that's a really interesting, unique model that we're seeing more and more. And then lastly, Salesforce has done an incredible job, and they launched. They were one of the first to launch an impact fund, and so they're actually on fund two. I think it's a 150 million dollar fund. Many of the uh, corporates and corporate venture capitalists in the United States have started announcing their involvement in impact or purpose. So Citi has an impact fund. Amazon and Microsoft both both look at supporting purpose driven founders, uh, DNI founders as well, uh, Prudential. Many others, they're all following suit, right? And so, you know, I, I think that in this next wave, oh, we'll talk about this in a second, but, you know, looking to foster innovation and purpose, I think is going to be this next wave of innovation that's coming. Ah, that's uh, that's great. Um, I'd also probably throw uh, Sapphire in there, and as, as oh, yeah. you said with the others, you know, SAP's right at the front of it. So it's, but it's always been heralded as one of these that is somewhat strategically aligned, but really free to operate, right? And mm -hmm. uh, and of course they've you know they've done well in terms of their their return as well. Let's let's uh, drill down a little bit on this uh, idea of what's what's next in. Uh, you know, in, in corporate innovation. I mean, put your prognosticator hat on, you know, what would you say for the next, uh, you know, five to 10 years, what would you expect to, uh, to see? I see two emerging trends in the corporate innovation space. So the first is that while corporates will continue to source innovation externally, I sense that they're gonna see a rise in effort to innovate internally and encourage entrepreneurship. So this may be in the form of a venture studio or joint collaborations with startups or, or other um, organizations. But you know, we corporates have spent this last decade learning, built up their reputation, ingrained themselves in the ecosystem, getting the entrepreneurial mindset within their employees. And so, you know, how do we leverage that new learned talent, right? How do we then um, scale that and create change? And so I I, I think that we're gonna see this more and more with corporates outside the United States. The second, uh, as mentioned a little bit ago, is 
focusing the corporate innovation to solve for purpose. And so what this may mean at the higher level is embracing digital transformation, right? Creating a more inclusive work environment um, and to scale businesses that solve for purpose. Over the last, let's say about five years, five, 10 years, you know, corporates have been channeling their efforts on strengthening their ESG rating. And so while CSR has been the company's commitment for stronger corporate values and scaling businesses, um, we need to evolve that and solve you know, directly solve for environmental and societal causes. And so investors and shareholders are becoming more and more vocal and aware of ESG and other impact me measurement and management scores um, and our frameworks. And so this is going to become a must, right? And the younger generations, the millennials and the Gen Zs are also paying attention to businesses that stand for good. So this isn't a future, this isn't just a trend. It's kind of the future of business. And so Corporates need to leverage the company's strength, marketing position, positioning, and we're going to see a rise in solving for scale in financial, social, and environmental causes. And so, you know, this could be this could mean deplastifying, you know, your, your supply chain. This could be creating fair work environments. This could be, you know, leveraging your technology to provide access to a higher quality of life, um, while still supporting and driving revenues, right, new or old. And so, I, you know, these are the two two trends that we're, we're going to see, especially with climate change coming uh, at full force at us. Um, corporates need to change, right? And it's no longer a, a, a PR game. The, you know, the, the millennials and Gen Zs are, are very aware. They are very proactive about making sure that what companies say and do uh, can be accounted for. And so the corporates then must behave and, and, and act properly. Corporate venture capitalists have always traditionally had, you know, two levers, right? There's generally what you call strategic alignment, right? Uh, which innovation is always, you know, a clear part of, and then the financial return. And a lot of them, you would hear them say, you know, bring relevant innovation and don't lose my money <laughs> was, <laughs> was the remit that they have. I like the fact that you've tied in impact perhaps as a third lever, or you could say it's, you know, something, uh, uh, um, one of the criteria, if you will, for strategic alignment. But this idea that impact now will carry much more weight, I think, is uh, is is quite interesting. You said Venture Studio a moment ago, and it reminds me of a podcast we did with uh, Guido Jure, who had uh, just left as the chief digital officer at ABB. And I asked him, you know, um, in hindsight, what he would have done different. And that's the number one answer he came up with. He says, we would, we should have launched the Venture Studio approach and concept earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, Moment has been lucky enough to support ABB on a, a Venture Studio since then. But it's uh, it's it's still a very nascent area, but I fully agree with you. I think that it's the beginning of a very strong trend that we're going to uh, to see. Um, let's let's kind of turn this around a moment, uh, if, because you know, Mitya, our investors in the space, and you have been as well. What uh, what do you look for in your successful or more successful startups? You know, I, I, I specialize or I, I focus a lot on new and emerging tech. So it's really working with early stage entrepreneurs. And so the three things, three things I really look for is if one, if they have identified the problem correctly and building the right solution for it, right? So does it create value that people are willing to pay for? Um, oftentimes when I talk to corporate leaders looking into this innovation space, I ask them how they define innovation and we get a lot of different definitions. Uh, my favorite definition for business innovation is a solution to a problem which provides value that people are willing to pay for, right? So it's not innovating just to innovate, but it has to create value that has some kind of monetary value attached to it. Um, and so without that criteria, um, you know, in the early onsets, it's okay, right? We're, we're experimenting with product market fit, but really they need to nail that, right? And, and then, then we could scale. Um, the second thing I look for is how it's positioned against the competition. You know, what is your moat, your competitive advantage? And then the third part behind that really is the team, right? Is this the right team to, to execute on this vision, to define and create that new market opportunity? Do they have the right mindset and motivation? And as, as cliche as all that sounds, uh, time and time again, you know, it all, it all falls down into those three, right? It's creating that right type of experience for the customer? Are you really becoming customer-centric, solving a pain point that they're willing to pay for? Um, and there's a lot of examples there 
Um, but really, it's just that seamless experience so that whatever I'm paying for has, you know, trem creates tremendous value to my daily life or, or whatever it is that I'm doing. It's uh, it's amazing. It always comes back down to you know those those three elements time and time again. But how many companies tend to miss it on one or the other, right? Uh, it's usually the what do they say the archetype of the hacker and the hustler. So you've got the technology catalyst and you've got the person who knows how to promote the heck out of it, right? <laughs> and hopefully somewhere in the middle is 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 a is a solution or as you said product market fit. So it's easier said than done. <laughs> oh yes, absolutely. So. The, the question I'm sure many of our listeners are, are thinking uh, really is, you know, what's what's next for you? You know, I'm, I'm trying to solve for that as we speak. Um, you know, I attribute I attribute where I am today because I I I work to pay things forward. And I've served as a mentor and advisor to various startup ecosystems, such as 500 Startups and Alchemist Accelerator since its early days. And uh, that effort has expanded for me to kind of reach out globally. And, and so over the six years or so, over the last six years or so, I've been quite keen on supporting purpose-driven companies. And so really my focus is to figure out how to combine my startup experience on product, my corporate venture innovation experience, and really support the tech for good movement. Um, and so I've been allocating some time, actually a lot of my time recently, supporting these ecosystems, including the Sustainable Oceans Alliance, Venture for Climate Tech, and the Extreme Tech Challenge, to name a few. And what's really exciting about this space is that there's so many venture-backable, purpose-driven companies emerging globally, and they're all solving unique challenges with technology, right? So there is a business model, they're using hard tech, and they're solving problems that, um, just bring tremendous value to the quality of life or to you know, remove carbon or pollution. And so I'm really hoping to bring my experience and expertise to accelerate this movement. Very good. Um, earlier, you mentioned an, an interesting book, The Corporate Innovation, I believe, Fifth Wave, you had said. Mm -hmm. um, so in closing, I always like to ask the question, you know, where do you find your inspiration? And I think that book was a good recommendation, but you know, what, uh, how, how do you continue to, to motivate yourself to keep your energy up? And, uh, and uh, you know, what, what, what is your secrets? I guess I should say. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, as, as COVID hit and the workforce is going global, you know, my, my inspiration really comes from working with people, right? The founders, meeting with the entrepreneurs, investors who see the world from a different lens, understanding their perspective and, and looking at their narrative of the future, you know? And so everybody has their ideal of what, what they want to do to influence change. And so, you know, I like to absorb what they're we're thinking about and combining ideas and, and trying to come up with something new. And so I'm also inspired by experiencing culture. And I've had the privilege of, of traveling all over the world, learning and understanding the history, and, and figuring out how to build bridges to shape these perspectives and mindsets, right? So, for example, between U.S. and Japan. Um, and the, the fun part about this is really like we're all here to solve these problems, these really intricate problems, um, fostering innovation in the startup ecosystem, uh, encouraging entrepreneurship, and, and ways to translate these innovation strategies that worked in Silicon Valley into other geographies um, that are bound by the limitation of company, the country's culture or you know capital access to capital, et cetera. And so two fun books that helped me understand culture one was a book called uh, Kiss, Bow, or Shake Hands, which is just this really interesting um, digest of how business and, and just the country's culture uh, is, right? How to conduct yourself there um, by, by country. And so if I was to travel to, uh, let's say, Malaysia, you know, I could just flip over to Malaysia and read four or five pages to just get a summary of how business is done, how the how the relationship culture works. Um, and as I was having this conversation, um, I was also pointed to a new book called The Culture Map. And so this the, the subtitle there is called Decoding on How People Think, Lead, and Get Things Done Across Cultures. And so as, again, you know, as, as COVID hit and the workforce is becoming global, you know, understanding the cultural differences and being able to work through that, I think is gonna be a key um, key requirement, right, for success. And so uh, so those have been things that keeps me inspired lately and, and, and I've been paying attention more and more to it. 
Oh, great, great recommendations. Kiss, bow, or shake hands, and the the culture map, um, and, and on top of uh, your other recommendation as well. So, well, Jay, thank you for sharing these great insights with us today. Thank you very much for having me. It's been fun. Oh, absolutely. So this has been Jay Onda, uh, Corporate Venture Capital Advisory Board Member for the National Venture Capital Association, and uh, if I can add, Accelerator of Purpose-Driven Innovation. Thank you for listening, and please join us next week for our next Momenta Digital Thread podcast. Thank you, and have a great day. You've been listening to the Momenta Digital Thread podcast series. We hope you've enjoyed the discussion, and as always, we welcome your comments and suggestions. Please check our website at momenta.one for archive versions of podcasts, as well as resources to help with your digital industry journey. Thank you for listening.